aggression and laying the foundation for an incredible economic turnaround. 15 consecutive months of robust job creation. The most recent jobs report showing that 431,000 jobs were created, approaching approximately 8 million good paying jobs that have been created during President Biden's time in office, a record in American presidential history, fastest rate of economic growth in 40 years. Unemployment has now dropped to 3.6%. It was 6.4% when President Biden took office just a short while ago. Wages continue to go up. And of course, the deficit has been reduced during his first year in office by more than $350 billion and may be reduced by an excess of a trillion dollars during his second full year in office. This is a tremendous foundation for the American people. Doesn't just happen automatically, doesn't just happen magically. It happens as a result of presidential leadership and partnership with Democratic majorities in the House and the Senate. And we'll continue that work this week, in part by making sure uh, that distressed restaurants and small businesses are able to receive uh, the relief that was originally promised to them, but because of overwhelming demand in terms of funds weren't previously available. That's bipartisan legislation with respect to distressed restaurants and small businesses that will be led uh, by Representative Blumenauer. And we, of course, will continue uh, to shine a spotlight for the American people on some of the activities that are taking place that are resulting in the high gas prices that people are experiencing, led by Chairman Frank Pallone and Congresswoman, Subcommittee Chairwoman Diana DeGette. Of course, there will be a subcommittee hearing on price gouging that is taking place by some companies that are making record profits. But instead of passing savings along to the American people, are pouring it into stock buybacks and wealthy shareholders becoming even wealthier at the expense of the American people. And we're going to make sure that the full story is told, both as it relates to Putin's price hike connected to gas prices, as well as some of the price gouging that is taking place uh, this week. It's now my honor to yield to our distinguished vice chair, Pete Aguilar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This week, the House will hold two of former President Trump's most loyal confidants in contempt of Congress. Last week, I highlighted a passage from Judge Carter's ruling, and I wanted to read it here again because it gets to the heart of why we're voting this week, our work as a select committee, and the responsibility entrusted to all of us on behalf of the American people. If the quote, if Dr. Eastman and President Trump's plan had worked, it would have permanently ended a peaceful transition of power, undermining American democracy and the Constitution. If the country does not commit to investigating and pursuing accountability for those responsible, the court fears January 6 will repeat itself. Those are the stakes of the investigation that we have in front of us and why it's so important to refer Dan Scavino and Peter Navarro to the Justice Department for contempt of Congress. These aides to the former president have refused to provide uh, a single piece of evidence despite our lawful subpoenas. Their failure to comply sets them apart from nearly every other witness and leaves us no other option. This is as clear of case of contempt as we have seen. House Democrats are committed to the principle that no one is above the law, and each and every day we get closer to ensuring that the perpetrators of the attempt to overturn the election are held accountable so this doesn't happen again. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Pete. Any questions? question. One, are you getting any kind of sense on if the House will actually vote on the COVID preparedness bill this week? And 
what is your message to the Democrats who rebelled against including that in the omnibus and now you guys are voting on something that's $5 billion less and doesn't have the global vaccine? Well, Leader Hoyer will speak to the timing at the caucus meeting earlier today. Uh, he did not mention a precise uh, date or time that we'll be voting on it, but uh, some of that may depend on you know when the Senate acts. And in terms of uh, whatever is sent to us, and to the extent it does not include uh, assistance for um, COVID relief in other parts of the world, that will be a work in progress that will need to continue. I think um, we have a general understanding within the House Democratic Caucus that this pandemic is not over for any of us until it's over for all of us. And that as the wealthiest country in the history of the world, the leader of the free world, we have a responsibility um, to decisively crush this virus wherever it may be found, and certainly to help underdeveloped countries uh, do that. It's the right thing to do, but it's in the best interest of the American people. And I know our work in that regard will continue. Um, we've heard many of your Democratic colleagues calling for Title 42 to remain in place until there's a comprehensive plan to sort of deal with um, what would be what they say is a disaster for border management. Republicans have signed this discharge uh, petition. Where do you stand on the issue? And is this something that you and your colleagues would support? Well, we're waiting uh, action from the president and uh, some visibility into how the administration decides to proceed. I have great confidence in the administration in terms of both making sure that we continue to lift up border security uh, while also recognizing that uh, we have laws related to asylum and those laws um, should be brought to life in the fullest possible way in the context of the moment that we're in. And I don't want to get out ahead of the administration in this regard. Uh, members are actively discussing uh, a way forward here. I think House Democrats are unanimously committed to the notion that we are both a nation of laws and a nation of immigrants. And finding a way forward to lift up those two very important principles, I think, is a commitment amongst House Democrats. But let me yield to our Vice Chair, Pete Aguilar. Uh, I, I think the Chairman said it, said it well. But let's step back for a minute and talk about, you know, Title 42 was put in as a, the former, by the former president is a stocking horse for border security. It was cloaked in pandemic discussion, um, but the pandemic has changed. So Republicans want us to talk about uh, things opening up and coming back, businesses, um, while we're moving forward with the pandemic because the condition, the underlying health conditions have changed in this country and we acknowledge that. That doesn't ignore that we are still back to two years ago and the concerns that we have about making sure we honor what the what the chairman said that we are both a nation of laws and a compassionate nation we can't pick and choose which refugees and which asylum seekers come to this country whether they are central american or whether they are ukrainian and so we're working with the administration and the administration has indicated that they have plans uh, to address this, um, but the, we are moving past this pandemic. Uh, and the next phase of that uh, is uh, the removal of Title 42. And so uh, we will continue to, with the appropriate committees, um, work to make sure we are prepared um, for the eventualities um, of, that, of that ending. Um, but let's not forget that the former president put this in um, because he wanted to send a message uh, about about the border, not because he wanted to protect the American public from a pandemic. He proved time and time again that that was never in his top three priorities. Uh, so we're moving forward um, and we will work with the administration uh, to make sure that they have the tools and the resources uh, to address this. Back to this side. Yeah, thanks. On the uh, restaurant relief bill coming up this week, I mean, this is something that members have wanted for some time. What are you doing to reconcile everyone's different priorities uh, heading into this? 
Well, I think under President Biden's leadership, the leadership of Speaker Pelosi and Leader Schumer, we have been actively moving to address a whole wide variety of issues. I laid out uh, clear evidence of that in the context of where we were when President Biden took office, the economy was on the brink of collapse and the steps that we've taken to turn the situation around significantly. Starting with the American Rescue Plan, continuing through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, finally infrastructure investment. There had been every other week for decades, infrastructure week, and nothing ever happened. And under President Biden's leadership, we have historic investment in our nation's infrastructure. Two weeks ago, we were able to move forward on a bipartisan spending package to meet the needs and priorities of the American people. But the work, of course, continues. And so this week, uh, it appears we will be able to move forward on bipartisan legislation led by Democrats uh, to address this issue of distressed restaurants and small businesses. And so the work will always continue, but our track record speaks for itself. Back to the first round. Yeah. Republicans seem to want to use the ending of Title 42 as an election topic. How concerned are you about the surge that's predicted to come and them using that in the midterm election to hurt Democrats? I think we have to continue to uh, govern responsibly. And again, we'll wait uh, for presidential action in this area. But we have a strong story to tell, and the Republicans have nothing but rhetoric. And often that rhetoric has no basis in reality. They have no governing agenda. They aren't putting forth ideas. And they're unwilling, of course, to denounce the pro-Putin wing of the Republican Party, the pro-insurrection wing of the Republican Party, and the pro-hate wing of the Republican Party. Instead, it's just rhetoric, often nonsense, with no good ideas being put forth to help out everyday Americans. So I'm not concerned about the Republican rhetoric. I was just wondering, so you guys are getting ready to go to conference on Justin Peacock. I asked Speaker Pelosi about this, and I wanted to hear you guys' take. Um, so there's a part in the Competes Act that it calls for increased cooperation with China about climate change, but it also takes action to crack down on their human rights abuses. I was just wondering, you guys, how you plan to kind of um, reconcile those two things, cracking down on them for one thing and then trying to cooperate on another. Well, I'll yield to Pete on this, but we, we are dealing uh, with a complex geopolitical environment all across the world, a globalized economy. And so there are challenges that we have to work through in the context of a globalized economy. And that, of course, includes China as a major player. While at the same time, we have to be true to our values as a free and fair society, as the leader of the free world. And we'll see uh, what comes out of the conference committee, but I'll have every confidence that one, uh, the speaker will designate individuals who are knowledgeable, strong, committed uh, to making sure that America is put in the most competitive position uh, so that our economy works for everyday Americans while working through some of these geopolitical challenges to make sure that we also are lifting up our values and the importance of human rights and respect, respecting the dignity of others. Yeah, I think the I think the chairman's right. Part of this is a discussion about the geopolitical environment, and some of them uh, are bilateral discussions among among the countries. And other uh, topics uh, will be addressed within this piece of legislation. I don't think it's going to surprise anyone in this room that the chairman and I are fans of the House passed piece of legislation legislation in the language there. Um, but we're going to give the space to the negotiators um, to try to craft uh, a deal that is bipartisan and bicameral. Uh, and then we look forward to working with our colleagues uh, to make that into law. But this is an important piece of legislation, a lot of details uh, to work through. Uh, I share the, the chairman's uh, confidence that uh, the speaker will put people at the table who represent uh, the views of the, of the House Democratic Caucus, uh, and we'll go from there. If I could just follow up briefly on this about, um, so we know China is one of the biggest polluters in the world. Um, <coughs> Why is, why is your caucus so adamant about increasing the cooperation on climate change when they're one of the biggest polluters? What is the end game? What is the goal here? 
Well, I, I think what, what is clear is that in order for us to uh, deal with the climate crisis comprehensively and with the fierce urgency of now, it's going to involve decisive action by the United States, decisive action by China, decisive action by India, I believe the three largest contributors to uh, carbon pollution across the globe, and of course, decisive action by the European Union collectively, plus uh, Great Britain. And so I think that is the right approach uh, because you can't simply solve the problem with just the United States alone acting. And a big part of the challenge is China and India and the European Union in partnership with Great Britain. And so I think it's the right approach. It's anchored in the factual realities on the ground and in the air and in the soil and in the water across uh, the globe. And I think it's the, it's the global approach that will continue with leadership from President Biden. I have a question for the Vice Chair. Um, I'm not asking you to, to confirm anything, but there are now reports that Ivanka Trump is to speak to the January 6th committee today. And I know the committee earlier this year, or maybe it was even last year, sent her like an 11 page letter with sort of why she's of interest. Uh, can you just maybe sort of, I mean, why, why is she so important to talk to? If that's, if yeah, I'd, re I'd refer you back to, back to the letter. Um, but, at its, but at its core, we're interested in talking to individuals who um, were in and around uh, the former president and the White House uh, during this important time. Uh, during January 5th and 6th, as well as the lead up and the many uh, events that were uh, orchestrated by those who were close to the former president um, that had, as, the, as Judge Carter said, uh, a coup uh, in need of a, of a legal strategy. And so, you know, those are the pieces that we're, that we're interested in. And so, you know, we're going to continue to ask these questions. I'm not talking about, you know, any particular individual, uh, but we're going to ask uh, and continue to ask a lot of questions. But I will say broadly, like we've announced about 100 subpoenas. Um, and we've had, as you've heard me say from this podium, over 800 interviews. So for every subpoena that we announce, there are many others uh, that we don't announce that are just part of us doing our job to seek the truth, uh, to get to, 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 get to uh, the events of what, ha of what transpired, uh, and to make sure at its core, legislatively, that we do what we can to make sure that this never happens again. Um, so um, irrespective of any individuals, um, we're going to continue to, to move forward uh, and to ensure that we're getting to the truth. Um, on the hearing tomorrow with the oil company executives, what is the, the message or the, the lesson that you hope people take out of the hearing tomorrow? What do you want folks to learn? Well, you know, I'll defer to Chairman Pallone and um, Subcommittee Chairwoman Diana DeGette uh, in that regard. However, I think generally we want to make it clear to the American people that House Democrats are on the case. Gas prices, of course, are a complex uh, issue in the context of both the geopolitical environment and decisions that are being made by these oil and gas companies and executives explicitly uh, to take the record profits that they are making and reinvest them in the shareholder class as opposed to the consumer class. That's a problem. And part of the job of the United States Congress is to hold people to account, particularly in an environment where you have a war of aggression that is taking place in the Ukraine. And as a result of Putin's war of aggression, uh, you have increased gas prices that have accelerated since he began to threaten Ukraine a few months ago and then invaded. And in the context of that international crisis, and we'll continue to stand behind the people of Ukraine who are fighting heroically and make sure they have everything that they need to ultimately prevail as they will. I think it's important for uh, American corporations, as we've seen others do, to show some patriotism and to stand on the side of everyday Americans. 
And at the hearing, at least, I think there'll be an opportunity to explore with these gas and oil executives what that kind of patriotism should look like. At minimum, it should involve ensuring that perhaps there's some relief that consumers and everyday Americans experience in the form of lower gas prices, given the incredible record profits that oil and gas companies are making right now. We'll go back here and then last question. Uh, when is the House going to vote on the restaurant bill? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't think Steny uh, mentioned that in particular, uh, but or I may have missed it. But he certainly can provide a precise answer to that question. I think it's Thursday. Thursday. Last question. On the COVID money, uh, the the, pen, the global vaccine money. Uh, you know, what's the way forward on this? I mean, is it appropriating new money? Is it moving around money that's already been allocated? And does it have to be done before the next appropriation bills go out, or you know, are you looking at it sooner? Yeah, it's my understanding that um, one the additional funding will be completely paid for. And that's been an approach that we've taken uh, responsibly. It's one of the reasons why we continue to experience tremendous economic growth. And at the same time, of course, haven't added to the deficit. It's been dramatically reduced. Um, in terms of the actual mechanism that will be employed, we'll see what the Senate sends over, right? The text is available. I'm not I don't want to get out ahead of uh, those who have been leading the effort on our side in terms of uh, whether that's something that we're comfortable with or whether there are proposed adjustments that may need to be made. But it's my understanding that the funding will not be taken away from any particular state, right, that may have unexhausted funds. But we also understand that there was probably some waste, fraud, abuse, or people who had access to funds that um, that may need to be reconsidered. So we'll, we'll, we'll see ultimately what the House settles on. The Senate legislation is out there to be reviewed. Specifically the global vaccine money, but that's not in there. You said that you know, you're going to continue to work on this. So, uh, you know, is this something that, that you guys envision sure. getting done? Yeah, let me. Yeah, let me. Let me yield to our resident appropriator on that question. No, all I'd say is <clears throat> one the the importance behind this, um, the importance behind the global um, uh, pandemic money is to ensure that that we have vaccinations across the globe. We can't get past this pandemic until more people are vaccinated. Um, and we know that with continued variants moving forward, the key to that is a vaccination. That's why we continue to ask people uh, to get be vaxxed and boosted uh, here in this country. But we have to acknowledge our commitment uh, to play a leadership role abroad as well. That was the importance of this $5 billion. Uh, now, uh, we aren't going to, it appears that the Senate language is not going to have uh, this included. This won't be the last piece of legislation that we do. And even some of the pandemic money that is included in here um, is in a limited window uh, to go to states and to go to localities uh, to make sure uh, that we're investing uh, in uh, moving past this pandemic and the health and safety of, of the country. And so, you know, with that in mind, there will be other pieces of legislation before we get to uh, the appropriations bills. And so uh, we're going to continue. Um, but as we as we are with with priorities that sometimes aren't addressed, um, I know we have to carry forward and, and ensure that this is the bill in front of us is not the last bill uh, that the U.S. House of Representatives uh, will do. Um, and we will have other options moving forward. Thank you. And the pandemic will not be over for any of us until it is over for all of us. And House Democrats will remain committed, as Vice Chair Aguilar said, to doing what's necessary to crush this virus decisively, not just here in America, but throughout the world.